So, hi everybody and welcome. Is it possible to increase your startup time already today by a factor of two? And will it be possible in the future to increase it by a factor of four? I'm Per, I work in the Java Core Library team at Oracle, and I'm excited to talk about Product Ladian today and improving Java's startup time. And I'm even more excited to do this together with Sebastian here. Thanks, Per. Uh, so I'm Sebastian Deleuze, uh, working as a Spring Framework Core Committer at Broadcom. Uh, I'm also working on efficiency-related topics and various Spring portfolio projects. And after the first presentation you will do, uh, I will basically present uh, the story of the collaboration between Project Laden and Spring Teams, what kind of features we have shipped in Spring Boot 3.3 based on that collaboration, and also show uh, demos and data points uh, with CDS and AOT Cache with Spring Boot. Exciting. So, let's talk about uh, the things that are going on today in the OpenJDK product. We have some of the more well-known products like Amber and Loom, but I think Leiden and Babylon is kind of well under the ice pack somewhere there. So, I hope to shed some light what we are doing within the Leiden uh, initiative today. Now, Leiden is uh, an open source project, of course, like any OpenJDK product. We have our own uh, project page where you can read uh, about the articles and the objectives of the project. And we, of course, you can see what's going on there with PRs and the comments and everything. And on the right hand side, there we have a link to the GitHub repository. So, Product Laden is about improving startup warm up and footprint. And who, for who of you are the startup time interesting? Well, I guess you come to the right place. So that's great. So I will talk about what is startup, what is warm-up, and what is footprint. Now, startup is the time it takes for the first, when you start your program, to the first useful unit of work. So, for example, if you have Hello World, it's the time before you, you know, hit enter and you see Hello World on the screen. And maybe in a more realistic case, if you deploy, for example, a Spring app, it's the time it takes from when you deploy it until it can serve incoming calls. Now, warm-up, on the other hand, is a little bit more abstract. Uh, as you might be aware, it takes some time before Java really gets up to speed, before, before everything is JIT compiled. So that's the time it takes to reach its peak performance. And the third objective is footprint. We're not going to talk about that so much today because we haven't worked with that so much. It might be a later concern. And by footprint, I mean memory footprint, because as it turns out, Leiden will you know, create a cache and store things there. So in terms of storage, it will actually require more space. And everything here uh, includes work done by the application, you know, parsing concurrency files, and work done on behalf of the application, like loading classes and uh, you know, compiling classes. But wait, when I first announced a Leiden talk many moons ago, I immediately got this uh, uh, message on, on social media. Someone said that Graal native image uh, is the thing here. Uh, in my opinion, it's a solved problem. And yeah, uh, maybe if you're willing to accept and concede a lot of Java's natural dynamism, for example, if you don't uh, specify upfront, uh, you can't use reflection, you can't use uh, proxy classes, uh, and maybe some other things. And it's even more importantly that you can't use any third-party library than is using any of those uh, features. And of course, you compile to a certain uh, architecture like uh, x64 Linux or Windows or whatever, and that's what we have. So, and then I got another tweet. Sample Spring Boot, time to first transaction, four seconds. But if I use crack, it's like 40 milliseconds. That's, uh, that's two orders of magnitude. Awesome. Yeah, and when I read this, I kind of thought of this thing here. Does anybody here know what that is? One. Okay, I'm guessing maybe not the oldest in the room. So when I was a teenager, uh, I liked to play games. I liked to write games, and I also liked to play games. But my budget was very thin, and I guess you see where this is going. So we were uh, a couple of, let's call us, enthusiasts that uh, I, I should be square with you here, we cracked games and we shared them. And as it turns out, in, at that time in Sweden, that was actually legal to do that. But this was this continuing arms race between you know, title providers and you know, enthusiasts. Uh, and eventually this guy turned up. It's called the ice pick. And what you do is that you turn this cartridge into the expansion port of a Commodore 64. 
Then he uploaded the bootstrap code onto this huge IC circuit there. It's eight kilobytes of memory, imagine that. Uh, and when you flip the switch, then you, then you flip the switch and you load your game as normal. And when you flip the switch again, a non maskable interrupt was generated and the CPU jumped to that bootstrap code. And of course, the bootstrap code created an image of the entire memory and created, you know, added stuff from uh, the sound interface and the video interface and put them in the image. And then you can just distribute this image and boot from it and bang, there you were. Awesome. Uh, and this has a lot of similarities with Crack, I would say, because, uh, of course, Crack doesn't have a switch, it's a software switch. And, of course, Crack, you can't run Crack on, on the Commodore 64, you can, but you can only run it on Linux. So there is a kind of correspondence here, and, and as with many technical things, and there is a cycle, and when you think you invented something new, someone else did this for 30 years before you actually came up with the idea. Uh, so Lanyard means, uh, and how much uh, before I continue here, there is a problem also with crack because just as the, the producers of game figured out that well, we can store stuff that this, this doesn't pick up in the obscure, you know, division counters in some, you know, timer and stuff that this didn't touch, and then we can check that and then just terminate the game. And it's the same with crack. So uh, when you take an uh, uh, image uh, mirror, then, of course, your file handles will not be valid anymore when you restore the image. If you have file handle 5, that file handle 5 will not mean anything uh, anymore. So you have to add uh, stuff to the programming model. You have to register with some kind of context and say, before you freeze, you have to register uh, all, a lot of stuff, and then you thaw again up from the image. You have to you know, re-register, maybe open sockets, open files, and so on. So it's a completely different model. Okay. Laden is much more ambitious than that. So we want to shift computational temporary later and earlier in time. And we want to maybe constrain the application in some way so we can enable more shifting. We want to do this eventually, selectively, as per need of each program. Uh, I will come back to that. And also, uh, the bigger thing uh, is we want to do this compatibly, preserving program meaning. And we want it, you know, Java has always been this thing you can run on any platform. And we want it to remain that way. So I'd like to think it about it uh, like this, like a mixer board. So for, for some uh, application, we might say that mm, I'm not willing to concede that much, and then you can get some speed up. But maybe for another, I, I can you know, concede everything almost and just sacrifice everything for speed. Uh, and, and so the programmer should be in control what's going on here. Okay. So that was much, pretty much part one. So now I'm going to talk about the circle of life for Java code. And this might seem a bit derailed, but I need to explain this before we go into the details on how Layden works. So I think you know when you start your, your code, your application, that it's slower in the beginning. And that is because it's in tier one. It's interpreting code. It's every bytecode is looking, well, it's this, I have to do this. It's another bytecode, I have to do that, and so on. And while it's doing that, it's collecting profile data, full profile data. That's the meaning of the F there. So it collects data that is statistics on what's going on. So if we call a method, for example, uh, and then you can record the statistics of what's the value of this int. Is it always a 3 or is it like uh, distributed in some way or whatever? So you kind of accumulate knowledge of how your program is actually run. And then as we advance, there is uh, another uh, intermediate compiler that takes your bytecode and compiles it in a fairly optimized way, it's called C1, which kind, of, which kind of is a springboard into the C2. The C2 or Graal is uh, what's the stationary you know, performance, that's where we want to go. But we don't want to go there immediately, because then we haven't collected enough statistics. If we would have gone to C2 immediately, then we wouldn't know anything about program behavior. So there is a balance to strike here. And Actually, the compiler, the C2 compiler, is able to speculate. Suppose that we have called a method with something that's always null uh, 30,000 times. Then the compiler can speculate and say that, oh, I think that this will always be null. But if it's not null, I will insert something called uh, an, uh, kind of an exception handler there. It's not a usual exception. It's, common, it's called an uncommon trap. So if something uncommon happens, then it's able to say that, oh, oh, oh 
Uh, my assumptions didn't hold. My guesses here were, were totally out of bounds. So I de-optimized again. And then we go back for a while, collect more data, and eventually end up there again. So it's important to understand this while we are going further. OK, so is Java a static or a dynamic language? Well, we think that Java is a static language, uh, as opposed to uh, you know, other languages, which I don't want to mention here. But Java is pretty dynamic, uh, because we have dynamic typing. If you have an array of string, and then you cast it to an array object, you can try to put in an, uh, uh, an int there, but that's not allowed to happen. Then we have to check that at runtime. We have dynamic class loading and verification. We have class redefinition. We can say that, well, this class used to be this, but now it's like that instead. We just talked about uh, dynamic compilation, jitting, and in my recompilation, de-optimizing, when we evict the code, the compile code from the code cache, and go back again, uh, you know, the previous slide, this one here. And we have dynamic linkage. First time you call a method, we have to ensure that you are actually allowed to do this. Maybe this uh, sits in a you know, safe haven uh, within the module system, that it's an internal method. And therefore, we must throw an exception if we try to do that. Now, luckily, that is cached, so we don't have to do that on every call, but it has to be done once. We have dynamic dispatch, which is if you have an interface, and then you can have uh, uh, 10 different implementations when you need to establish which of these variants are we going to call. We have dynamic introspection, we have instance of reflection, and more recently, pattern matching, which we heard about a talk, I think, in this very room uh, not very ma uh, many hours ago. So as I said, Java is pretty dynamic. So I think it's more relevant to discuss what is changing and what is unchanged. So we can take a look at this uh, you know, field declaration up here. We have static final long random value equals something that probably is different every time we start. So is this static or dynamic? Well, it's a static, so it is static in one sense. But initialized, it runs at runtime, which sounds dynamic. But the variables uh, is held constant all the time, uh, or at least almost all the time. So it will never change. So that is a bit static. And it doesn't coincide with compile and runtime. So it's this kind of fussy thing that things are born dynamic, but can be treated as static. And I think this is something that JVM is very good at. Uh, and it's been there from the beginning. It's seldom that we have, you know, have to choose one, lose one. It's more like we have this yin and yang situation where we can actually choose both. OK, so what happens at startup? Well, as I mentioned, we have activities that are part of your program, reading configuration files, scanning for annotation, maybe spring annotation, opening sockets, and creating loggers. And while we are doing this, the JVM is occupied with the little reading classes from disk, validating metadata, and running static initializers, and starts to interpret our code. Uh, we do call site linking, uh, constant pool resolution, and then we start gathering profiling. <clears throat> and what happens during warm-up? Yeah, maybe our application is, you know, populating caches. And the JVM is uh, using the profiling and does a JIT compilation of hot code. Uh, hot code is code that will soon run a substantial amount of, of times, for example, 30,000 times. So this sounds very inefficient. Why do we do this? Uh, it sounds like we have a very complicated machinery. But the, these all of dynamic features that make Java much more expressive. Imagine that we didn't have instance of. Imagine that we didn't have uh, co JIT compiling. That would make Java a very boring and inefficient language. And if you think about it a step more, you can actually do stuff very much later than, in, for example, if you create a native image. We can see exactly what stepping our processor has and adapt the compile code after that. We know how the program has been run, so we are fairly confident that it will behave the same in the future and can do speculation and assumptions around that. So we can, we can optimize code based on beha observed behavior and not just the code. And all this is great for peak performance. The cost is slower startup and warm up. So I think in many applications, this is a good trade off. Well, you start a, a spring app, for example, and let it run there for a month or two or a year. Then this is a win. <clears throat> but in other cases, there is not. So this is kind of a sigmatic uh, illustration of an application. The yellow line indicates some, a somewhat typical application, and the green line is some kind of ideal behavior, some kind of, this is the best we can ever do, uh, just made up. And we see that the first invocation, it takes a substantially long time, but as time passes on, we are approaching the green line. 
because we are gathering more profile data and we are you know, optimizing code. So that's catch initialization, uh, which is usually x milliseconds. And this is the JIT activity for warm-up, which is usually meant in CPU seconds. So what we need to do is to, to improve the startup, we need to push down the first uh, point here. And in order to improve warm-up, we need to push down the entire curve along all those task repetitions out on the right-hand side there. So this is the kind of an area that we need to get rid of. And to do that, we need to shift things off the critical path. So we can shift things uh, later in time, so for example, using laziness, and we can shift work earlier in time, uh, for example, at building time. Uh, and this can be a part of the framework. I think Spring uh, can do this for us, and it can also do uh, this in many other uh, scenarios. So shifting computation is something we already do. It falls out of normal Java semantics, like we have compiled time constant folding, like you remember this static field we, with random. That is the, the VM is able to, to uh, constant fold this because it knows this value will never change, so you can treat it as constant. We have garbage collection, which is actually something that we, you know, say that oh, I want to free this object. Freeing something is not referencing, but the VM is able to decide by itself when it should be free. It's can do this you know, a minute later or an hour later or whatever. We have lazy class loading, and we have some required work by the user, like uh, the current CDS, which we're going to talk about more later. So it's all fair game as long as the program meaning is preserved. And actually, if you start to scratch the surface, it's more than that. Uh, reading the Java memory models, which is incredibly difficult to understand, at least what, that's what I think. Uh, then we have semantics within a thread. It's is F serial, so if I declare A equals 1, B equals 2, and C equals A, then I'm allowed to do this in reverse order, because presumably I already have the value of A, which was 1, into some register, and then I can initialize C, and then only after that I can initialize B, because they have the same semantic meaning within the thread. But of course, if I observe that from another thread, they will have different views of data, so in order to uh, exchange data between threads, you have to establish something called a happens-before relation. Uh, so threads don't have a serial semantics uh, knowledge of other threads. And this is all described in your model. Uh, don't go there and read it if you can avoid that. Uh, you have shifting computation in hardware, which you have in the CPUs. You have out-of-order execution. You have speculative branching, SIMD operations. We can take one operator and, and affect that on a lot of data. At the same time, we have CPU caches. Maybe you write a value to memory, but it's only uh, getting stuck in a cache and updated again. So it's actually never written to memory. And it's only after a while that it's written to, to memory. And that's shifting things to later. And that improves performance immensely. And there are more things to, to talk about here. And later, we'll then expand options for, for shifting. So some of them will require no specification changes, like something we call the AOT cache. Now, the AOT cache is a new thing, ahead of time cache, where we put stuff, and we can use that cache when we start up to be able to start much quicker. Uh, and we are also thinking about other things. Uh, for example, we have something called stable value that me and Maurizio has been working on lately. Yeah, so I will just uh, make a small excursion on that. Stable value is something that sits in between. Um, a mutable and an immutable field that gives kind of the best of two worlds. So you can see the preliminary yet there. And you can have like, you know, most applications have a logger, but you can say that this is a stable value. Uh, and then you can just set it when it's used. And this will have the same performance as you would have declared it final from the beginning, but you can initialize it later. So that's, uh, I think it's a very good, you know, improvement of, of Java. And I think we're going to see this. In, in, vari in various places, uh, maybe in the JDK itself and also in applications. So, uh, like a mutable field, you can update it how many times you want, uh, and in mutable field, it's always set one time. But the stable value sits in between, and it's either not updated or it's updated. So it's updated at most once. Uh, just as a mutable, I can update it anywhere in my code, it's eligible for constant fooling, just like a stable value, final value, and I can do concurrent updates. So the first thread that sets its value will actually win. So, 
go back to the, the normal program after this derailment, and we can talk about today's AUT cache, which is shifting using CDS. Now, the class data sharing, CDS was introduced already in five. So that allows us to uh, you know, have some internal JDK classes put in this kind of AUT cache. And then we added for the Lambda proxies, uh, we added in JDK 8. And then in 10, we got this app CDS. And I want to ask you, how many of you are using app CD today? One, two, three. Oh, that's a record. Two was the previous record, so that's great. Uh, I mean, here we come to my first question. I started, well, is it possible to increase your startup performance by two? Yes, use app CDS. And we expanded on this, and the AUT cache will replace the CDS as we go along, and we'll be the kind of a main key tool for improving uh, Java startup time. And here's how you do it. It's like, you say that I want to record what's going on here, and I want to put that in the configuration file, where I gather you know, all the calls, all the classes, and everything. And when that's been done, I'm going to have exit my program. I can convert that kind of a working file into an AUT cache. Uh, that's a separate step. And then once I have the cache, I can just say, that I, I want to use this cache. And then everything will get much faster. And it's going to be very exciting to hear Sebastian here talking about exactly how fast that will be. OK, so there is the caveat here. You have to do a training run, because that exercises the code. Uh, so that can be an integration test, or it can be that you run an actual application and then harvest uh, the AUG cache, and then you use it the second and the third time you're running the application here. Uh, and the AUT cache is actually uh, close to make it to, into the JDK. So we have a JEP up and running where we uh, can store class objects, reflect the mirrors. We can have constant pool references to classes, methods, and fields. We can have a resolved, you know, invoke dynamic linkage and all the stuff I talked about before. Pre-initialization of most enum and hidden class sense. And loading of this is made in bulk, actually, by just memory mapping this file. So it will be loading like 100 times faster than just you know, scanning through a file. And this is just lays the foundation for future enhancement. Uh, so here's the JEP, ahead of time method. Oh, that's not the JEP. That's the next JEP. So this JEP is uh, about not only storing the class data, but it's storing also the method profiling that we're doing. So we, we have these all statistics available for us. And actually, we're also uh, thinking about actually storing the code cache in the cache so we can start off and our code can be almost uh, warm when we started from the beginning. Uh, this will not come in the next release, but it might show up in, in a fairly uh, coming release. And Sebastian, the floor is yours. Thanks, Per. So <clears throat> we are going to see how we can leverage CDS and IoT cache with Spring Boot uh, as a use case to build enterprise uh, features that are useful for your uh, concrete use case. The kind of workflow we are going to see today is the following. You are going to perform a training run of your application, of your workload, typically a Spring Boot web application. That will be used to create the cache that Per uh, mentioned. It will be serialized on disk, either in your container image or uh, directly on a, on a volume in your platform. And then this cache will be used to speed up uh, the deployment run and improve the efficiency on three main metrics. The first one is startup time. We want to decrease the startup time, a fast startup, even a cheap server. So uh, you can just use cheaper servers. Uh, and we want to potentially be able to scale to zero. Uh, on your Kubernetes platform to just not pay anything when your application is not used by basically achieving um, less than one second startup uh, when possible. We also want to reduce the amount of memory consumed because also cheap servers, and we want to reach peak performance as fast as possible. So how did the collaboration between the project Layden and Spring team started? I think the starting point was last year, uh, in GVM Language Summit 2023, John Rose and Mark Reynolds presented the first public talk of Project Leiden, and there was a few interesting uh, points. What caught the attention of the Spring team was that there was a Spring Boot case study where we basically had two main realizations. The first one is that uh, CDS already allows quite a nice performance boost. Uh, and CDS is already available in most of your GVM distribution, so it's something actionable today. 
and uh, spring ahead of time optimization that we have originally built for GraalVM native image support, but we can use spring IoT optimization optionally on the GVM as well, uh, is working in synergy with CDS and IoT cache, which is here identified by the pre-main branch. So based on that, you may wonder, I mean, uh, there was your pool where we saw three ends uh, of people using CDS. So why, I mean, if CDS is cool, if uh, AOT Cache is the successor, why nobody use it, okay? I think there are two main reasons. The first one is that there is a set of constraints that you have to fulfill, and all of them, in order to get uh, CDS benefits and AOT Cache benefits. You need to use the same GVM between the training and the deployment run, you need to follow a set of pretty strict rules for your class pass, use only jars, no directories, no wildcards, no nested jar, and guess what? Spring Boot executable jar is using nested jar, so not a good fit. And deployment class pass must be a superset of the training one. Um, also, you have fulfilled all those constraints and you naively copy your application somewhere else and then you change the timestamp of your jar files. CDS optimization thinks that you have changed the class pass and uh, the optimization are vanished. So it's pretty easy to uh, break those assumptions when there is no dedicated support. The second reason from my point of view is the training run itself. How do you integrate that in your project lifecycle? Do you integrate that in your CI CD pipeline? What do you do if um, there is a connection to remote services when you execute the training run when building your application and packaging it? It's not obvious. So um, we have been working on trying to make it possible that Spring Boot make it uh, easier to use CDS and AOT cache with two main features. The first one, like I said before, uh, nest, the executable jar is not CDS and AOT cache friendly because it's using nested jar. So we have been adding a support for extracting uh, an executable jar, just no additional tools, just a Java command, and the executable jar can extract itself into an efficient uh, file layout that, by the way, you can use directly on production without CDS and IoT cache. It's uh, super efficient as well. And basically, this extracted version that is, doing, is going to store a library as files directly and is going to create a tiny jar for your application classes and sh provide a manifest file defining the class pass. You can still use Java dash jar, but with this new jar that you have extracted, and you will get better performance uh, and CDS and AOT cache friendliness. So let's see a demo. We are going to build our famous pet clinic application with Maven in order to create our executable jar. And we are going to start it naively with just Java dash jar, my executable jar, and we see the baseline for the startup time. Okay, so pet clinic is starting here in 3.2 seconds. This is our baseline. Now, I'm going to uh, basically use this extract command in order to extract my executable jar into a CDS and AOT cache friendly file layout with our extract command. Then I'm going to check that my files look like what I expect. So we see our lib uh, uh, library directory and the tiny jar. Okay, all good. And now we are going to uh, use the project laden distribution of the GDK, enable AOT cache with this cache data store parameter that will likely uh, change shortly, and enable a spring parameter that will automatically exit the application before starting the lifecycle, because here we just want to load the classes, we don't want to fully start the application. So when the GVM uh, exits, the uh, AOT cache is created automatically. So you have to wait a few seconds, okay. We get our IoT cache. We are going to check that the files are existing. Okay, cache.cds, cache.cds.code, we are fine. And then we are going to start again our application using the same command, just we are going to remove the spring parameter that automatically exits the application. And uh, pet clinic is now starting in uh, 800 milliseconds, which is pretty cool because we don't have introduced a lot of constraints. So, so I think that's a pretty cool uh, improvement in terms of startup time. So if you want to have more data points, we can see here that CDS, with or without Spring IoT, you can uh, use both variants, allow to uh, basically speed up the startup time by a factor of two compared to executable jar. And project laden IoT cache allow to speed up the startup time by a factor of four 
which is pretty cool. Of course, that will depend on your application, so you need to start that with, you, with your workload, but I think it gives you a, an order of magnitude of the improvement you can expect from Project Layden AOT Cache, and CDS is already usable now. Memory consumption, as mentioned by Per, it's not yet a focus, but what we can say is that currently we observe that combining Spring ahead of time optimization and CDS allow to reduce the memory consumption of Spring application by 20%. So we hope and expect that uh, project laden AOT cache will at least allow the same kind of benefits and maybe more. But let's see in a few months. So extracting our Spring Boot executable jar is cool, but that's a bit low level. And we wanted to provide basically a feature that is as simple as a flag to enable. So what we have built with uh, build pack, and by the way, we document that in Spring Boot reference documentation with Dockerfile. It's just more work because you need to write your Dockerfile with various steps, but it's possible and documented. But with build pack, which is an open source project that allows uh, with Spring Boot to create a container image with one command, so Maven Spring Boot build image or Gradle Boot build image, we have a flag, a CDS flag that we can enable, and we have also a Spring IoT flag. And what this flag is going to do is four things. <coughs> is going to extract our Spring Boot executable jar with the extract CDS and AOT cache friendly command. It's going to automatically perform the uh, startup of your application, the, the training run, uh, by exiting automatically the Spring application like we have seen in order to create the cache. It's going to ship the CDS cache within the container image in order to have a self-contained optimized artifact that you can deploy to any cloud or on-premise platform. And it's going to modify the Java command to enable uh, CDS when you run your container images. And I think that's, uh, that's pretty cool because that makes it a fully integrated feature. You may have to customize your configuration in order to avoid to have remote database connection, but usually that's as simple as defining the uh, dialect of your database in order to avoid some <coughs> early database interaction, so that's uh, not super complicated. But uh, Project Layden IoT Cache is more than just a faster CDS. It also allows to retain most of the JVM warmness, and we are going to see uh, a demo of that with Spring Boot. So here, I'm not going to build my uh, uh, cache during the, the packaging. We are going to create a Docker file that basically builds the Project Layden branch, extracts our Spring Boot application with the extract command, and starts uh, the JVM with the cache data store parameter to enable IoT cache. Uh, and we are not going to exit the Spring Boot application. Here you want to keep it running because we are going to deploy it. We have um, Docker Compose where we define the volume, where we will store the, the IoT cache. And then we, star we start our application. So it's a regular cold start because the IoT cache files are not yet existing. Okay. And we are going to simulate a production workload with a, a, a benchmarking tool called OA, when you will see that our cold start uh, is going to uh, slowly increase the performance uh, as time passes, but we start pretty low. Okay. But we have applied some production-like workloads, and so when we stop the application, uh, the cache code will store the warmness, and we are going to check that the files are existing, but uh, I think the one that is, is, is stored in the .code uh, file. And then I'm going to start again my application with exactly the same command. And then I have the fast startup, but also I have warmness that, has, uh, that is much, much better than what I had during a cold start. You can see that I'm reaching peak performance much faster, and that basically from the startup, I get pretty cool performance. So if you want to check what kind of performance we have. We have the blue line here where we have the regular call start of our Spring Boot application, and we can see that in close to 20 seconds, we reach peak performance, and then my JVM is hot, everything is cool. With the IoT cache, we can see that instead of starting from the interpreted mode that is pretty slow, uh, we are starting from a pretty nice level of warmness, and just in a few seconds, I'm able to reach peak performance you may notice that the peak performance plateau of IoT cache is slightly lower than the regular uh, JIT, but that will be fixed, that's just a temporary glitch, and the project laden team has confirmed that in a few weeks or months, basically the IoT cache version will be at the same level than the uh, blue line plateau, so no, uh, no drawback in using IoT cache. So, 
I usually uh, get questions about, okay, there is RALVM, Project Rack, AOT Cache, and of course, it's personal advice. I mean, uh, uh, you have your analysis, I have mine, and you have likely yours, but I want to provide some, uh, my point of view, basically, because uh, I'm a big RALVM fan. I have been uh, introducing, uh, leading the introduction of uh, the native support with the Spring Native Experimental Project uh, uh, with other member of the Spring team that is now integrated in Spring Boot. And it's pretty cool because you have instant startup, instant warm-up, reduced memory consumption, but as mentioned by Perl, there is a price to pay. Uh, the price to pay is that you have EV and slow compilation and there are compatibility issues. Uh, modern framework like Spring Framework try to do inference of the reflection, proxies, resources, entries that will be required to run, uh, basically, Spring Boot application with GraalVM, but you likely have to add your own because you have your custom libraries that is not designed to run on, on uh, GraalVM native, and based on the feedback we have, that's, uh, that's difficult. So GraalVM is cool, but it's likely not for everybody, not for every use case. Project Crack, mm, I think Project Crack, uh, it's more difficult to see the real benefits. And uh, I mean, you have instant startup like with native in a few milliseconds, but there are very big drawbacks that uh, limit its adoption in practice. So Spring Boot 3.2 introduce initial support for Project Crack, but people trying it are usually blocked because of two main category of issues. The first one is that basically there is big lifecycle issues because when you do your deployment uh, run uh, in optimized fashion, you are not starting your application, you are restoring it. That means that you need to deal with file handles and open socket issues, but that means also that your Spring Boot configuration is not going to automatically be updated because it's not a start, it's a restoration. So you have a lot of complexities in terms of lifecycle of your configuration and that's, uh, that's an issue. It's Linux only, so if you want to um, use it locally from the developer experience perspective, you need to use Docker on Windows and Mac because on, uh, it will only work on your Linux. And the other big category of issues with Crack is security because it's pretty low level. It's going to serialize the memory representation of your, of your application on disk, including the passwords, including the secrets. And so if you want to ship that on your container image, I'm not sure the security team of your company will be okay. And even if you store it on a volume, it introduces some constraints because you are storing secrets and that's a bit tricky. So crack, uh, I'm not sure there will be a, a, a very wide adoption uh, in the future, but that's my guess. JVM with CDS today and AOT cache tomorrow. I think it's pretty cool because it's, uh, it's not a, it's, it does not allow as dramatic gain as RALVM uh, nat native images and crack, but it's still pretty cool. I mean, 3x faster startup, 4x with Spring IoT. I think that's already pretty cool for most of the need and use case that we have. It allows to retain the warmness uh, with the training run. It's hopefully going to reduce a bit uh, the memory, and we may have good surprise. Uh, let's see. Fast compilation. And the main side effect you will have is basically training run side effect like early database connection if you want to run the training run during your packaging, but it's pretty simple to fix that. You can customize the configuration. It's documented on Spring Boot configura uh, documentation. And that's it. So I think we are left with basically people wanting uh, yeah, huge optimization. Maybe they will be okay to pay the price of GraalVM. Uh, uh, and it's okay for, a lot of, for various use cases, but I expect the majority of application to be fine with the uh, optimization provided by project-laden IoT cache, and I think it has the potential to hopefully have uh, more end raised when we will ask in a few years how many people are using project-laden IoT cache, because the price to pay is pretty low, and the benefits are already pretty significant. Now, uh, thank you, and back to you, Per, for the yeah, end. Thank you so much, indeed, Bastian. So, time-shifting works. Uh, this overall approach shows great promises, significant gains, full compatibility, and almost no new constraints. In fact, you can't do early class loading replacement. Uh, that's a, a small constraint, but I think it's worth paying that price. No changes to the programming model, no changes to the specification, and it retains all of Java's natural dynamics that we so much love. 
And it's largely a rearrangement of, of what we already have, plus some new stuff. So a little bit of recap, what's up first? We have YEP 483, uh, which will come real soon. Uh, and then a follow-up where we can store profiling and a head of Compilecom to increase the warmth when we start our application. And we are looking to do more things. We talked about new uh, ways to bring shiftability into programming model using uh, um, stable values, for example. And we have more ideas. We're just getting started. So uh, why don't you kick the tires yourself with your application? Go to Layden, early access, and download it, and try it on your app. Or, and go to Spring and see and do all the fun stuff that Sebastian here did. And I think with that, we are um, ready to take some questions, if there are. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Any question? Yes. Yeah. Can you reuse those caches? I mean, if you make, uh, if you create this cache and make a new build, can you use the old caches with the new jars? Uh, so the question is, can we reuse the cache if you rebuild the application? Uh, and no, I don't think so. I think you have to gather new statistics because the code will look different. So I think that's, uh, that's my guess. Yeah, no, not all optimization will be available, but you can. Uh, Maybe if you just change a few classes, uh, you, you could, but that's not really first class. But what we ca you can do is compute a cache and add just a few classes at the end of the class pass. Those additional classes, like some GDBC driver that you had on production, won't benefit of the cache optimization, but the rest of the cache uh, will be used. So basically, it's not all or nothing. You can basically benefit from uh, the big optimization that you have done for most of your application, and the tiny additional jar will just load as usual without uh, resetting all the benefits of your IoT cache. So that's, uh, that's pretty cool. Good. More questions? Yes, there's a hand uh, way up there first. So the question is, for the training run, do you just run your application on real data for a few hours and gather uh, you know, uh, data? And yes, you can do that, but you can also... I mean, if you do that, you will not benefit the first time for startup and, uh, and warmness. But, uh, but if you can run on, on a trainer and maybe you have an integration test that's running on some test database and does the same thing, then you can do that. So you have those two options. Yeah, and my second demo was basically uh, simulating that with the, the Docker file. It was really the mode where you are using the same command. You saw uh, Docker Compose up was not changing that. First startup, it's slow, and basically cold start, and the second one uh, will be faster. Uh, we, we have tried to work a bit on that on the spring side. And we have found that it's much easier to do that on production because we don't have to simulate the production workload. Integration test, it's possible. But there is class loading issues and various things that make it pretty hard. So on our side, if you need warmness uh, uh, benefits, we, I think we will move forward on yeah, trying to use this production uh, deployment uh, use case, which is uh, easier to, to, to use. OK, so there was another question there. Yes, please. I, I didn't hear. Maybe you're a bit younger. Yeah, I think me. you're asking if we can <laughs> provide some kind of manual ins to the compiler to make optimization even more powerful. I, f I don't think currently we can. I think there is some kind of related discussion these days on the project laden mailing list. So feel free to have a look. Uh, we have some ongoing discussion on, so, uh, on those kind of things, but I don't think that currently there is no public API to provide more ins, etc. But there is some related discussion that are happening on the project laden mailing list. Okay, uh, I'm not aware of that, but okay. Okay, not aware of that, but trust you. Okay, so thank you so much for listening. And if you have qu questions that you want, will not want to ask, so everybody else here, you're free to come here and discuss them with us face to face. So thank you again. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.